Um, so hi everyone, uh, welcome to tonight's event. My name is Bree. I'm the Assistant Events Director at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Mass. If you're familiar with our store, welcome back. And if this is your first time hearing about us, welcome. We're very happy to have you join our community this evening. And we appreciate the support of your, these authors and independent bookstores through purchases and attendance to these events. Uh, the chat and question box are open, so feel free to make use of those. We'll come back for a Q&A at the end of our time. Uh, but please note that Brookline Booksmith has a very strict policy against abusive behavior and language. And at our discretion, any attendee can be removed from an event for taking such behavior. Okay, so on to the fun stuff. Um, I'd like to introduce our kind moderate moderators tonight, the Shepherds of Conversation. Uh, first, we have Amber Benson, who can basically do it all. She's an actress, a writer, a director, a producer, and even sang in one of the only musical episodes I have ever enjoyed on TV, ever. Uh, recently, she's been lending her voice to audiobooks, which I highly recommend. Uh, next, we have John Rogers, who is famously one of the best things to emerge from Worcester, Massachusetts, myself and the smiley face included. Um, creator of a personal favorite, The Librarians and Leverage, taken from us too soon and screenwriter of the upcoming Marry Me. And then, of course, the author of the hour, Corey Doctorow, is a special consultant to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, an MIT lab research associate, and a visiting professor of computer science at the Open University. His award-winning novel, Little Brother, and its sequel, Homeland, were both New York Times bestsellers. He's also a personal favorite of my own regarding internet ethics and tech activism, as well as somebody you should definitely be following on Twitter. His timely standalone novel, Attack Surface, brings readers back to the Little Brother universe. We follow Marsha Maximo, cyber counter-terrorist agent, who has thus far been able to conveniently compartmentalize her life and even believe she's one of the good guys on most days, until the horrors of her profession and the surveillance monster she's helped create turns its eye closer to home. And with that, I will leave it to our three personalities. Um, I will disappear until if you would like me to read Q&A questions at the end, just let me know. But thank you. Great, thank you, Bree. And, and, and thank you, John and Amber for joining us. Hi, Amber, how are you? Uh, Amber just squeaked in under the <laughs> wire, but I'm glad you made it. It's always great to see you. Uh, Amber and I spent five Aww. days on Zoom together at the start of the lockdown because she read the audiobook of Attack Surface. And rather than all go to the studio and get Yay. each other's cooties, she locked herself in her basement and read it there. Um, so uh, uh, tonight <laughs> the, the theme is cross-medium science fiction and you two are the most cross-medium science fiction people I know. You have people who write multiple media, you engage in multiple media, you are performers, you do all of the things. And so I, 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 I as someone who's, um, stolidly single medium right as someone who's who's who who mostly just deals with the fairy tales that are written down on boring words i am hoping to get, gain some insight from you two on this and and as i mentioned in our setup emails i've i've given i've got a question for both of you to start with but then i hope we can just kind of be off to the races here um so uh one thing that strikes me about the difference between screen and literary fiction is that um in literature, you have the pretense that you know what another person is thinking. And on the screen, you never know what another person is thinking unless you have a hacky director who gives you over, uh, voiceover. Uh, and for the most part, you're expected as an actor to um, convey the interiority through implicit stuff, not to explicitly give your tr train of thought. It's literally the opposite of how novels work. And so Amber, I'm really, um, confused and excited by your career as an incredibly successful actor and an incredibly successful novelist. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about how it is to work in those two modes, the mode where you are as explicit as an explicit thing and the mode in which you are never supposed to explicitly tell people what you're thinking and instead convey to them implicitly what's going on in your head. Well, <laughs> I think, um, that is the beauty of a performance um, as far as like, like acting or dance or, you know, anything where you're using the, or, or even vocal performance, singing, audiobooks, radio, anything where you are the, is the performer are, you know, kind of um, interpreting the medium for the audience. 
So you are taking, it's like playing telephone, basically. You're taking what the author is, is putting down, the screenwriter, the songwriter, the, uh, the, the audio, you know, the book, write, the novelist for the, for the audio book, um, you know, or, or, you know, a choreographer, somebody, you, you are, you are sort of like that middleman interpreting for the audience what is being given to you. Whereas when you are, you know, the, the, the primary sort of creator of the material, it's, it's your vision. And then it goes right into the, like the brains of the audience, the readers or, you know, um, or the you know, like visual medium, like the painter goes right into the brain of, of the person looking at the painting. Um, so I think you, you are tasked as, a, as, an, as an artist, a creative artist, as an actor to, to sort of do justice to the medium that you are interpreting. So you have to be really mindful of, of what's being said and you have to um, really be, you have to be thoughtful. You have to look at the material and, and figure out a way to interpret it where you are trying to do the best for, for the person who created that material. Does, does that make sense in any way, shape or form? I've been moving well, all day. <laughs> I'm in well, my well, car. <laughs> well, 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 let me let me backstop you because um, that's a fantastic answer. And and by the way, I'm a giant <laughs> fan. I, I am I'm a really giant fan of your work. So this is super exciting oh, for me. Come I think on, like we go with. Like, I feel the same about you. But 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 there's um, I actually um, I actually liked your version of the Scousy book a little better. Don't tell Will. Um, the see, when you did the two parallel one. Um, the, the interesting thing, the thing you have to train writers to do, uh, screenwriters, is a lot of what we do is uh, screenwriting is inherently, inherently collaborative. Um, a unfinished novel or a novel that's sitting in your desk can be published and it's a complete work of art. Eventually, Confederacy of Dunces being the most famous version of that. Um, you know, a painting can be discovered and be found to be a great work of art. An unfilmed screenplay is just an unbuilt blueprint. And so one of the things that is a challenge is for young writers saying like, stop trying to put directly in your head what is in the mouths of the actor. That's not how this is gonna work. You are trying to convey yeah. what a character is feeling. And, and, and this is yeah. interesting. There's, there's a guy, I'm sure Amber's read it, um, Judith Weston's um, Directing Actors is a book I make all writers read. And it's essentially, yeah. I sit down with a writer the first time before they go to set and we take all of their beautiful dialogue and every turn of phrase they've agonized over and we cross it out and we do, what is, the, what is the character trying to achieve right now? What are they feeling right now? Because when the actor turns to you in, on the set and says, what am I doing here? They don't want to hear, well, I really thought I was trying to get across their internal dialogue. They want to know I'm angry. I don't want this person to win this fight. I'm feeling. Yeah. Because art, art is the transmission of feeling. And, yeah. and we build our transmission modules around it. And when you are conveying to an actor, you are, you are handing up. And I have to say, the, the happiest moment for me as a screenwriter, and I've worked with some truly great actors, is standing on set and they do the line and you're like, that's not what I meant. That's better. You know, and it's, it's, that's, that's when you win, is when the, the art was additive. Oh, God, yeah, this is, uh, I, I think she'll come back. That's yeah, certainly I want to make sure that I wasn't had. me freezing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, that's certainly experience I had. Um, <laughs> sitting, sitting in on Amber recording the book, there is this element where, you know, I know what I meant. And then she finds a thing that I didn't mean that's, that's even smarter. And that, that certainly made the audiobook very exciting. John, you touched on something really important, which is that in this collaborative nature of the work, is that the work isn't finished until you find other people to finish it for you uh, when you're doing audiovisual material particularly. And I think to, to a great extent, comics too, which you've done a lot of, there are some people who, who do it all, but most of the time it's, it's a collaborative. Certainly that's the case when I do comics. And, and I wonder if you could t dig into the, the terror and the glory that is making something amazing that only gets to live if other people live up to their end of the bargain. I'm thinking, well, I, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, you go ahead. No, but, but that's, that's interesting because it, it you know, recently uh, I wound up on Twitter, somebody, something came up and I'm like, yeah, like that's, um, I have written and ne never mind the hundred, couple hundred episodes of television I've supervised or rewritten as a showrunner, but I have 
uh, written for movies or pilots. So clean v visions of a like five, five years of this in my head, you know, when we're going to go make it, I've written 30, 10 have gotten made. And that's considered a ridiculously high average. And that means I have thousands of pages I have agonized over and cried over and worked at at 2 a.m. that I may as well have tossed into a jet engine and watched the confetti come out the back for the good it did. And so, you know, there is this, this weird thing where, you know, and, and that's what I wind up again as sort of an older writer in Hollywood now, just prepping people for the heartbreak. It's like, you have to get other people's money. You have to get other people's talent. You have to, your job is not just to be a writer. If you, and that's what, we, look, it's not meant disparagingly, but there's a little bit of it when we're, when we're in Hollywood. Like if you want to, everything that's in your head to the audience to see it, go be a novelist. Like that's, that's what a novelist is. <laughs> like your job is to first sell people with, and, and look, by the way, I am sympathetic. You know, if you're a studio exec or you're the person with the money, some idiot like me has to come strolling into the audience, into your room and goes, here's a bunch of crap in my head. Give me a hundred billion dollars. And your job is to go, well, that sounds like entertaining stuff you just imagined. Here's a hundred billion dollars. That's his job. That's insane when you think about it. Um, but that's how we do it. And, and so, so much of, and, and by the way, some people, William Goldman always said, um, every writer needs a hobby they have complete control over because in your job, you will never see the vision in your own head and it will drive you mad uh, because you will never see exactly what was in your head or on the page ever made. And it will, it will oh, break better. You. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, and look, he's old school, you know, and, and, and I say this as an, as a writer who likes actors and, and look, there's obviously always a contentious thing, but, but you know, everyone who's worked with me on set has seen the moment where I start bouncing up and down a little because I can actually hear the metronome of the scene happen and the actors found it. And this is, you don't get this from words on a page. You get this from chemistry of humans. And, you know, the first time I directed, uh, you know, the DP came up and said, all right, Joan, what do you want to do here? I said, oh, I want to show that Aldous is very isolated. So I want to show a camera over his shoulder and he's surrounded by these people. He went, right, right, that's good. But how about we really an L track? We run two cameras at the same time. We put out eight, eight pages and you go to get that beautiful shot later. And I'm like, that would be better. Thank you for not <laughs> letting me make a fool of myself. And I've had a cameraman go running by. I mean, Gary Camp, a camera on both Leverage and Librarians is one of the best camera operators on the planet. And I was directing an episode and he went running by with a camera and I'm like, what are you going to get? He went, trust me. And just jumped on the back of a moving train so he could get the pull away shot of like Beth Reescraft fading into the darkness. And he had, and like, I didn't call that shot. I didn't know I needed that shot, mm. but, but he did because he's a specific artist. And I think that's the, the, the wonder and the terror of this part of it is like you, you have a totally uncontrollable, assembly of talent that you are assumed to be in control of and have to pretend to be in control of and the trick is never actually fool yourself into thinking you're in control of it because the guys who do they're not good people <laughs> they're 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 not good yeah you know, so i'm not amber, a big fan amber, of the auteur showrunner yeah, um, that's not i'm not that person amber i'm afraid you're going to break my heart because i was waiting for you to say well novelists don't get paid as much as people who work in the screen <laughs> trades but at least you get to see your vision realized and you don't have to mess around with other people and you just said it's better is it better no no i meant oh I, what, what i meant was um when some when you're on set and you're watching a scene and the mm -hmm. actors and all the people working with you like elevate what's on the page you what's in your head i have found personally is never as good as mm -hmm. what happens when that magic on set kind of comes comes into being and you just it just transcend like you're like oh i love what is in my head but they made it even better like i worked uh, i did i direct i co-directed a film called drones starring angela bettis and um there was a line that that angela had to say she's playing an alien uh who is working in an office and she's going to to destroy the world spoiler alert uh this is a very old movie so if it's a spoiler alert it's a problem uh but she's like there's a line was like you mean crazy like a crazy person. And the way she said it was so different than I could have ever like imagined when I was reading it. 
that it just like elevated the, like the whole thing like you're like oh she's totally an alien this person is not a real human like no human would say it that way yeah. <laughs> so um but no like the control freak in me loves the novels it's the best thing ever comics and well novels and comics because you know if you're doing a comic that you're getting paid for it's going to happen and, and yeah. some of the books it doesn't always happen i've written stuff that has never gotten published i'm sure you know we all have those those weird little sort of novellas or half novels hidden away in drawers that you're like oh or you could be like my dad who has his memoir in screenplay format 2000 pages long i i will i will i will give you some wow <laughs> it's the bhagavad gita <laughs> Wow. I, I, I will give you some, I will give it back to you, Corey, on the advantage. The, the thing I'm jealous of as a screenwriter is, and this comes from somebody in the, the, the thing asked us about King Killer Chronicles, and that unfortunately is not happening for a variety of reasons, primarily oh, as I explained to Corey. Yeah, um, corporate stuff. It, it was uh, the CBS Viacom merger that unfortunately, um, you know, I have a song, I have a song for the King Killer franchise by Lynn Memo Miranda on my phone, and wherever in a bar, I'll play it for you. But it, we wrote all 10 scripts and it's never going to happen. Um, oh, and, and look, but, but what I will say, the thing I, that I think every screenwriter is jealous of for novelists is working with Pat on that project. And I'd be like, it, it, we'd talk about something. He's like, this is the truth behind X. And I'm like, that's great. How do I do that in two and a half pages? I mean, because I would love, I would <laughs> love to be able to do 150 pages on the internal monologue of the song about this. I, I mean, it's, there's so much richness and there's so much elegance and there's so much, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, you write great speeches and dialogue, but, you know, my, I tend to do well as a screenwriter because I actually write pretty decent prose. My scripts read well. But it's something the yeah. audience will never your see. Scripts do. I read your scripts. They read like, like literary scripts. Can we but, read but your that's for the Are exact. they somewhere we can read them, John? While uh, the not a lot. My, a lot of my stuff is not up online. Um, I am much, uh, Javi uh, and a couple other writers have put their stuff online. I'm trying to figure out what's not NDA yeah. because I'm restarting my blog and website soon so I can throw some stuff up. Okay. Um, but but, I, but like that's, that's just how I write and I, I enjoy writing that, but that's so the executive reads it and can hear the story. And, and so the, the actors get the intention behind it and particularly action. I enjoy writing action, but like, the the ability the every inch every inch of a produced television show or movie is hundreds of thousands of dollars and i just like at some point you're like i love this but is it is it i have x amount of money is it worth this where you don't have an infinite number of pages in a novel you have more yeah. you know yeah, even if it's true. just a you know if you have a i mean look there, the thing i love about a tax surface I'm like, we really need to just break this out so that we can do uh, welcome to Internet Security 101. And Corey will just narrate it. We'll do like the whiteboard dude explaining. Because that's like the best, the best explanation of public cryptography, uh, public and private key cryptography I've ever seen is a burned throwaway in your novel. It's like one right. page where Mash is saying like why Tanisha doesn't do it because it's boring as hell, right? right? And it's like, I could never do that page in a script. Mm -hmm. because it was it's just not visually compelling enough and it doesn't have enough emotional stakes and there's nothing for an actor to do with it uh, but it's a vital and interesting and cool and her attitude during it is character defining and, and you know we don't get that you know yeah we, we don't get yeah. that nuance and that depth and it's you know for me it's an urgent piece of the of the prose effort is to figure out how to do pedagogy well I had a revelation last year. I was teaching a writing program and uh, I was doing a one-on-one -on -one session with a very good writer. And she said, uh, you know, I learned all these rules for writing. You know, you don't, don't use said bookisms and don't use, um, uh, you know, don't use um, disquisitions in the middle of the prose and so on, show, don't tell. And, and yet there are many books that I enjoy that do that. When, how do you do them? And I said, you know, I think what's actually going on here is that some things are easy to screw up. And so if you are trying to figure out where the book went wrong, start with the stuff that's hard and see if that's the, the place where it screwed up and maybe try something easier there, right? That, that you know, if your gymnastics routine's got a couple of triple lutzes in the middle, I don't know if that's a gymnastics thing. Uh, <laughs> I think that's thing. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's a skating thing. It's a skating but, thing. It's your Canadian then try, showing. Try yeah. putting something easier 
in there and see if the whole thing isn't more fluid when you're not trying to do varsity stuff in the middle of your in the middle of this exercise and and you know exposition's hard to do well but exposition is not bad good exposition yeah. is great and i ex expository prose is some of my very favorite mode of writing so you mentioned, John, uh, this, the, the pain of the cutting room floor, the abandoned project. I had a brief stint working for Imagineering as an artist in residence. And I realized that Imagineering for all of its, its storied creativity, which is all true, is the, is the final scene of Indiana Jones, where you go to the ends of the earth to, to bring back the most incredible treasure ever seen and they stick it in a crate and they <laughs> stick it on a shelf and no one's allowed to talk about it ever again. And I, and I wonder, like that for me is a thing that I, I would struggle to do as, a, as part of, you know, how I earn my living. And, and I wonder, like, I mean, you know that some of the stuff that's been shelved is great, right? It's not like, it's the, not like you the, killed. The, the two best things I've ever written will never be seen. Yeah. Uh, so and I, I am fully, that? I, and I've, I've read people, I've had people read the scripts and go, this is the best thing you've ever written. I'm like, I'm fully aware, but they are both based around IP that has mm. changed hands enough times that, um, that it's just, they're, they're an internal maze. Uh, I told you not to make a Dianetics movie, but you wouldn't listen. It was, I really <laughs> believe, you know what? Everyone blows off L. Ron Hubbard's pulpy detective novels in the 50s, and I really thought that was the way to go. Fear is good, um, fear's a good one. Yeah, um, no, it's, it's just, to, just to go back for a second on what you said be, before we get to that, is like uh, one of the things I tell young writers when I'm working with them is your mistakes are your style. Because they're always like, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Is this script good? I'm like, it, it's, it's not good or bad. It's a compelling read or it's not a compelling read. And I'll know when you start to hit your style, when you make a really interesting wrong choice. And because so, that's the moment when I'm reading a script because young writers have to ape the style of the show, right? And mm -hmm. so they try to do their best. And then you get a script where it's like, well, that's wrong, but it's really wrong in an interesting way. And that's the writer they're going to be uh, as they sort of as they sort of break away from you. Um, but, but look, the, the, it's hard. I mean, there's, there's a reason writers, screenwriters drink so much. Um, yeah, there, <laughs> there is, it, it's, uh, I mean, Josh Friedman and I, do you know Josh personally? I know you've, you've bumped into him. I think. So Josh Friedman, of course, is the great, um, the great uh, screenwriter. He did the Terminator TV show. He's written a bunch of other amazing stuff. He just did the Cameron avatars. Uh, you know, but we actually have a favorite restaurant we now go to whenever he's fired off a project that we actually go and hang out at so we can talk about it because um, you're going to get fired. Your projects are going to go away and you have to create this, this hallucinogenic state of being able to accept constant failure and really believing the next thing was going to work. Hmm. Um, 110%. And, and look, that is the, that is the, the, the tough part of it is, um, and some projects I've been able to go like, all right, well, I knew that was coming. And some projects I've had to go sit in the dark room for like a month and just like laid out and stare at the ceiling until the urge to make stuff comes back. Um, but there's, it never stops hurting, you know. And, and, Amber, how do you, how do you stay, you're, you're one of the sunniest disposition people I know. How do you stay so sunny about all this stuff? Or is it I'm all an, an act? I'm an actor. Yeah. Um, no, it's funny, like listening to you guys, I was like, so, you know, the definition of, of insanity, right, is to keep doing the same thing over and over, hoping that you're going to, something's going to change, right? Is that just being a writer? Like, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> banging your head against the wall until doing the same things over and over until somebody's like, oh, that's interesting. I like that. You're like, but it's just like all the 50 other things I wrote. I don't understand. <laughs> um, how do I keep my sunny disposition? Um, I have a, I, I love what I do. I love all the different things that I do there. I get like, there's a joy in figuring out like when you're working on a, on a, on a book or a script of the puzzle of putting the pieces together. And there's this like ding, ding, ding moment when you're like, Oh, that's, that's how that works. That scene is, that's, that's the scene, you know? And sometimes you'll get notes and it'll change, but like, it's, it, it kind of clicks into place. And once it's in place, you can move it around a little bit, but like, it's kind of there you know that, it, that it's working and you're like, what is that? How do I know it's working? But it's just like, it's your brain making that choice. It's not like there's like an objective, like, oh, this work, like there's probably 50 different ways to do it. You know, I, I don't know. Do you guys find that when you're writing that something will just be like, oh, this is how it's supposed to feel. 
this is the right thing. And it's, you know, it's very intoxicating. Well, well, I think that's how you get through the pain of disappointment is the act of writing a script is, is in itself pleasurable. You know, the act of creating 55 pages. I don't regret writing the scripts that never be made. Like I regret they'll never be seen, but I, every single one of those has something I did that I'm very proud of. And in the moment I was very excited about figuring out. And I think that's, that's the, look, isn't that the whole trick to life? Like getting your short term dopamine hits to get you through the hard part for the larger success. I mean, it's just the human experience. I have to tell you yeah. how I, how I shot myself in the foot with this. So, so <laughs> I started selling novels while I was very busy. I, I was doing a startup and then I went to work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation and became their European director. And I spent 28 days a, a month on the road. I stopped plugging in my fridge because it was costing me 10 bucks a month to keep my ice cubes frozen. And I, uh, and I wrote the whole time. And the thing that let me write every day and that I still write a page every day, two pages now on the book I'm working on, every day, five days a week, I don't miss any days, no matter what. I finished my second page 10 minutes before we signed on to this call today. Uh, and, and, and Yeah, and the, the way I do it is I had this realization that though there were days in which I felt like the writing was as, as good as anything I'd ever done and like that clicking feeling you're just describing, that joy. And then there were days when I felt like the writing was terrible and I was like, no word that I could think of was a good word. And that though there were parts of the manuscript that resulted where the prose was amazing and there were parts where it was terrible and needed to be torn up and restarted, that the two were unrelated. That the, the thing that predicted how I felt about my prose was how much sleep I'd gotten, uh, whether I'd had a square meal, whether I'd had a fight with my spouse, you know, all of that stuff had much more to do with it. And at first it was incredibly liberating because I realized I could just sit down and just type and if the words were terrible, I'd fix them later, but I couldn't even know if they were terrible and I wouldn't for six months. And then 10 years into this, I realized the corollary, which is that on the days when I felt great, maybe I was writing shit. <laughs> <laughs> and since then, it has been the most anhedonic. I mean, I, I still yeah. love being a writer, but the, even on the days when I feel great about my writing, I'm like, maybe it's terrible. You know, I, I, you know, I, I think it, I think it's interesting because look, it's it's interesting to be discovering stuff ten to fifteen years into your writing career because your relationship to the work changes and your relationship to your own brain changes. Sure. Um, and and look, and to reinforce for any young writers that are watching this, uh, something that we say as a mantra in Hollywood is page count equals happiness. Like, just write two pages today. You're just gonna That's feel why better. Ron Hubbard was so happy. Yeah, yeah and just, his father. It's, it's just write two pages. You'll just feel better if you get two pages done today. But I think what's interesting is it, 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 I realized, and I've been doing this 25 years, about six to seven years ago, I began to very firmly separate out the, the, uh, the writing process from the revision process much more formally. Mm -hmm. So I would revise as I wrote. And, and as a result, my scripts were often very good because they would, they would be, the first act would, would have been rewritten 30 times when they got a first draft because I'd rewrite it constantly. And I moved to a straight, non-judgmental puke draft about six to eight years ago where it's like, I'm just going to make 60 pages. I don't care if it's bad. You know what? Its job is to be bad. And I, I beat that into writers now I work with them. I'm like, this draft's job is to be bad. If it's good, that was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> yeah. but but lean into the fact that this job this draft's job is to be awkward and gawky and stupid and too wordy and it's not going to work and that takes everything off and then you can go fix it and because because you can't if you're judging the pages as you're making them i that's that is brutal you know because that's your inner critic getting a shot at you every day as opposed to your inner critic only getting a shot at you after the draft is done. And it's easier to handle then because you've got 60 pages to beat them over the head with. How about you, Amber? What's your, when, when, when you're writing uh, screen or comics or, or prose, is there a variation? Is it all, all the same for you or? Um, you know what the variation is, is, is like the, the beginning process. Uh, for books, I have to go away to start a book. Like I have to go, like, I, I will check into a hotel for two or three days to start a book. Um, I can write books in coffee shops. I love writing books in coffee shops. I love writing. Uh, I have a, a writer's group. Actually, Javi is part of that and Kate Rorick, um, who I know you know, John. Um, well, Kate, Kate is running the Leverage Reboot. Actually, I'm only consulting on it. She's actually show running it. Yeah. She's the 
I, she's just, I'm she's so amazing. proud of her. Um, but, uh, you know, so we would get together in coffee shops and write, we called ourselves the shamers. There were a bunch of us. Uh, and so I could do books that way, but I can't write screenplays around other people. I have mm. to do it at home, um, at my kitchen table or in like at my desk, I just anywhere in my house. It has to be, it has to be inside. I don't know why. I don't know why I can't, like, I, I feel really uncomfortable writing, writing like stuff that I'm, I'm doing like, you know, it just doesn't work for me. I don't know why. Um, but the process, the process is always, you know, um, I, I kind of, because I'm, I'm finding things as I'm writing often. Cause it's different than when you're, I think when you're on a show, I haven't written in that way when you're, you know, you're having to get things done on a, on like a, a, a timeline that's eight, you know, you get eight days, go eight days, go. Um, so I'm always taking, I have more time to find things. So I do kind of, revise as I go rather than just do a straight up vomit draft. I know my first draft is going to be kind of poopy, but it's, but I will have reworked it a bunch as I'm going. And, and oftentimes I'll find things that, that I like, Oh, that I, that now goes here in the beginning. And I'm always just sort of moving the puzzle pieces around. Um, but I do think with books, it's always a vomit draft. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I am, I'm not reworking that one because there's just so much to get through. So that, that is different, I guess. Um, I, 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 always, <laughs> I, I beg your pardon. I, I, I always think that um, the, the place where a book starts to tick over is the place where you forget that they're imaginary people. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you're just using the part of your brain that just tries to predict what your friends might say or do. Uh, yeah. And um, that revision forcefully reminds you that, that you made them up. And it's like Wiley e. Coyote yeah. having run off the cliff, and you just need to not look down. Yeah, there, yeah. there is. It, I mean, and it's different when you're writing for actors too, because after a while, I mean, it, and look, I, even my pilots, which I will spend, which I have an infinite amount of time to write, I will do the vomit draft. It's not just when we're on deadline, but when you have a show, you then can hear the actors after you can a while. Hear them. And and it's like, okay, this this rhythm is Gina, this rhythm is Beth, this rhythm is, and and you know. Uh, and even on my first show, you know, uh, you, you know, it was a sitcom, so you could really hear the actors' voices because it was comedic. <laughs> but, but the thing you're talking about is fascinating because it's one of the things I love about writing. I was doing a book adaptation one time, one of my first screenwriting assignments, and I was just writing the scene, and it was about it was a thriller, and they were just trying to get the the cool assassin plus Scotland Yard person from here to there, and I'm typing away, so I'm just listening to the characters. And the female Scotland Yard investigator goes, well, why don't we just fly straight there instead of taking the ferry? And I stopped and I went, why don't they fly straight there instead of taking the ferry? There's a plot hole in the book. There's a plot hole in the book that she just found because I wrote her smart and she wouldn't have missed it. And now I'm fucked because I found this plot hole. God damn it. And I spent like, I, I literally got up from the table. My wife saw me and I stormed around the table. I was so angry at this character for giving me a day's worth of extra work. But that's the joy of it, right? Like when you're in it, you are just listening to them talk. Yeah. They are just your imaginary friends. And sometimes yeah. they are very inconvenient. <laughs> so you, so John, I, I, you've raised another good point, and I'm going to ask you guys one more question, um, and then I'm going to do. I realized that I was supposed to at the top of this do like a three minute reading, so I'm going to do the yeah. three minute reading at the bottom of it, and then we're going to go to Q and A. And Amber, tell me, how's your time? Do you have time for the Q and A? I, we go to an hour. I, I, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting slammed with texts as we're doing this. My, oh, uh, okay. my dad. He's 82. We're moving him to a senior living facility, and so I was like, I was like, um, I'm gonna go for a little bit. I'll be back. Uh, but he's texting me like gangbusters, and I I'm on my phone for Zoom, so I don't know what he's saying. So okay. I should probably so Amber, back. let's do this. Why don't we ask this one last question, and then and then we'll say goodnight to you, and I'll do this brief reading, and then we'll do a Q and A with the uh, with the audience. I really okay. appreciate your being able to dial in. I know that this oh is gosh. a tough time. Oh, I love this book. Everyone needs to buy this book. It's so Aww. good. Well, Those... they had to to attend tonight, so <laughs> the, the mission accomplished. Um, yeah. So my question is about adaptation, which. John, you just brought up, and and again, like to the extent that I that I ever kid myself that the life of a novelist is better than the, than the life of a screenwriter, it's about um, not uh, it's about 
producing in a cheap medium. John, you touched on this, that you can, you can burn Atlanta on page one and it costs the same as to have page one consist of someone uh, drinking a, a cup of tea. Uh, and what we see in screens is that there's, an, there's increasing returns to scale where tent poles are really important. And when you're spending a lot of money, you wanna be uh, sure of some return. And the indicators that make it likely that you'll get a return is if you base it on something that's already successful. And so we see reboots and we see adaptations and we see adaptations of reboots. And there are areas in which this feels like it's great. Like it's like, um, it's like doing a competition to write the best sonnet you know, like rebooting the best 60s sitcom or the best, making the best film adaptation out of a Disney ride or whatever. But there's also a, a it feels like a real conservatism there. And both of you are involved with adaptation and both of you are involved, especially, uh, uh, especially Amber, you're involved with like canonical world changing media properties. What's your relationship to that conservatism and, and how do you feel about it? And, and what, what do you say? I think it's my job when I'm working in, in, in that, that sort of medium to be as thoughtful as possible about, about maintaining the integrity of what you're working on. Cause you so badly, like as a creative person, at least I do, I want to like go in and like mess it all up and change it, make it different. But you're just, you are trying to, to do service to, to something that already has a fan base. You want them excited, not to the point where you're, you're pandering to them, but that you are staying within the confines of what, what it originally was, what the, what the property originally is. You can make it crazy and interesting, but you still have to be mindful of what, what came before. Um, so I'm, I'm always very mindful of that. I always want to be respectful of, of the property. Um, Unless that I've been told like, hey, we want this to be a total like, like game changer, do something totally different with it. Um, I'm, I'm working on a Hallmark Channel movie right now that's based on a cozy mystery series. And they're like, um, we want to lose this, this, and this, and add this, this, and this. And so you're like, oh, so it's very different than the book, but you told <laughs> me to do that. So I'm going to do that versus, you know, like when I work on Buffy stuff, I try and be super respectful of the Buffy fan base. Yeah. Uh, to to build off Amber's thing, there's there's sort of two things. One, um, you know, when it's funny, I pitched something for the King Killer Chronicles because it was a prequel show, and I pitched something to Pat because it's different when your creator is involved, right? When it's not just an IP, oh, but when it's yeah. a human being's work, and you can talk to them. Because I, I pitched something to Pat, and I said, the great thing is this completely changes a lot of the meaning of the first chapter of your book, and he's just staring at me in horror. I'm like. Oh wait! You actually <laughs> like the meaning of the first chapter of your book. That's that's that wasn't book. a mistake. That wasn't. No, I was trying to do something <laughs> cool here. You're actually really horrifying. Okay, let's back that off. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I think that to, to be specific is the thing you have to do is I never take an adaptation of something I don't love, and you have to whenever you're adapting, it's like why did I love this? You can change everything, but why you loved this? Because that's why the audience loved it, and you can change anything in an IP. And, and, and that's kind of the battle between creativity and conservative, the, the conservatism you're talking about. Corporations are conservative. They, are in, they, they just want their returns. They don't want you to screw around with it. And so you're trying to give them what they want, innovate enough to be creative and not stale and pandering, but keep in mind that North Star of, why did we all sit down for this story? Mm. You know, and, and we sat mm. down for this voice. Or, that's, it's often hard. And, and by the way, the times I've been around when it's gone wrong, <laughs> is where the studio or network had a different uh, i've asked a question in the room and occasionally gotten fired for it where i was like who in this room loves this and <laughs> and and it's like if if nobody in the room loves it nobody can write it or make it because that's why we're making it even if you're making it for the crassest most commercial reasons somebody's got to love it because that love that act of love is what communicates to the audience you know, and they'll, they'll give it back. Um, yeah, and I've had my parking validated and been sent on my way at least twice after asking that question. <laughs> uh, Amber, I really appreciate your having the chance to come uh, in here. You know, was, working with you on this book was great. No, I, this was a dream. I had such a good time and I felt like I learned so much. It's, this stuff's really important, especially now in the world we live in, we need to be aware of, of all the technology and how it can, and it can corrupt us, right. you know? 
Yeah, well, and you and I and and me and 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 John both have a, a tentative agreement at some point to, you'll come by and have a drink in our backyard. And yes. I'm really looking forward to thanking you in person. And Amber, thanks very much. I hope your dad's right. move goes very well. Thank you. Bye, John. Right, take care. Bye, take care, Thank Amber. You. I know. Hopefully I get Hopefully. to hang out with you sometime. Yes. Yeah. Bye. All right. Um, so I'm going to do this very brief reading, and then while I'm doing that, uh, there are a couple of good questions from Adam in the in the Q and A. If anyone else has some questions, they can drop them in, and then John and I will answer your questions until the top of the hour. Uh, John, thanks for hanging in there with us. So I, I looked for a nice cinematic reading uh, for tonight, uh, and I came up with a scene in which um, uh, uh, the protagonist Masha and her friends are in Oakland and um, they know that they're being hunted and um, they have uh, gone off for from the hotel that they've been hold off hold up in uh, for a snack run we passed a 7-eleven and i proposed a snack run yeah i paid again for my dwindling supply of cash i'd need an atm soon and we were just apportioning the bags when we heard the crash outside i'd heard car wrecks before and this one was wrong even by crash standards it took me a moment to figure it out it was all smash, no brakes. Usually there was a brake squeal before the smash, the panicked prelude to the crash and groan of tortured metal, the tinkle of glass. This was just wham, no run up, no brakes. It was very, very wrong. I looked around the 7-Eleven. It had a huge picture window like every 7-Eleven lined with shelves and racks, each more useless than the last when it came to absorbing a hypothetical car crash. Maybe if we crouched all the way back at the far side of the store, between the last row of shelves and the cooler, another crash, a scream, glass tinkling, or maybe successive rammings would trap us between crumpled rows of display racks and razor-sharp shards of reinforced cooler glass. I heard whimpering and realized it was coming from me. Marcus and Ange had gone pale and were eyeballing the shelves nearest to us, clearly doing the same kind of mental mathematics as me. I think we have to get out of here, I said. We need to find something solid to hide inside of. The clerk, a young Latinx guy who'd barely said two words to us, was confused, giving way to fright, his eyes wide. What's going on? Did you see the news from Slavstakia, I said, the cars that started running people down? He, sh he cocked his head. The world comes at you fast, and most Americans had never heard of Slavstakia. Maybe? I shook my head. Somebody hacked all the self-driving cars and sent them to run down protesters. There's protests all over Oakland today. Another crash, followed by two more. These ones with squealing brakes as human drivers tried to avoid the collision. A different kind of information cascade, a cascading failure where non-combatants served as force multipliers, suicidal robocars startling near human, nearby human drivers into their own crashes. And I don't know for certain, but I think the same thing is happening here. There were sirens now and screaming and the screech of tires. I watched as a car mounted the curb in front of the 7-Eleven's parking lot and smashed into a pole. Across the street, another car crashed into the window of a subway store and its engine was revving as it tried to keep going, nosing aside the tables and bur burrowing its way in like a fox down a rabbit hole. Fuck, let's go, I said. Ange was the first at the door. Keep heavy things between you and the road, she called. Fire hydrants, poles, park cars. That sounded like good advice. I followed behind her. Where could we go? The majority of autonomous capable and fully autonomous vehicles in Oakland were commercial, mostly trucks and other heavy equipment. I wouldn't want to be in a three-story house after one of those plowed into the ground floor at full speed, not even if the building had a full suite of California building codes seismic bracing. Marcus and Ange were by my side, sprinting, me, sprinting with me from car to car. The four-lane road was lined with plazas, motels, strip malls, nothing that I'd want to try and shelter in. It was dark and it felt like every car was on a murderous trajectory, though most of them were just panic drivers sprinting for somewhere safe, just like us, except that they were behind the wheel. Two fender benders later, we were on a long street of low rise apartment blocks with wide lawns that offered zero shelter from onrushing cars. Rows of parked cars down the curb lanes bristled with menace. I don't like this. I was panting, too much time spent behind a desk, too little spent on a treadmill. Marcus and Ange hadn't even broken a sweat. I think we should go to the jail, Ange said. We both stared. She started to tick off her reasons. One, it's fortified. Two, uh, McCullough said she'd send a legal assistant there to help with Tanisha. So we'll have someone who knows the law available to us. Three, that's where the protesters are and they may need help or maybe they can help us. I hate this idea and those are very good reasons, I said. 
Marcus and Ange exchanged a complicated look that reminded us all that they had a whole married couple style nonverbal communication system worked out. Yes, Marcus said. I sighed. Does anyone know the way? Are we going to have to turn on a phone? And that's the reading. That's my, I think that's my most cinematic of, uh, that would be the most expensive of the scenes anyways to produce in the, in the uh, book. Um, so uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat here. Um, by, by the way, I, I want to say something as somebody who sure. makes television. That's an incredibly cheap sequence. That's what's oh. hilarious about that. Oh, it's because all it's all implied. foley. It's all oh, yeah, foley. sure. It's all sound. The explosion in Slovakia is the, the bit expensive. where she escapes and the riot. That's expensive. Yeah. That's, a lot of someday experts. we're going to sit down. We're going to sit down with your books and go through and actually figure out how much it would cost to make one of these. <laughs> <laughs> From your mouth to a studio executive's ear. Yeah. Uh, all right. So Adam got a couple of questions. And first, we'll take one of his. And then David's dropped one in there now as well. Um, so. Uh, uh, here we go. How can writers in all genres include pedagogy without seeming heavy-handed or didactic? So, John, have you got any any feelings on this? Uh, the uh, look, it, 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 you can make anything heavy-handed and didactic. Aaron Sorkin's a living example of that. I mean, you know, you you have a, a you have a you know pedagogy is an intention, uh, not a technique. Um, I think that I think that basically the trick is to make sure that all information is relevant to emotional stakes. Uh, you know, the first tool you always have in getting across any sort of information is make it an argument. Make it there be emotional stakes and have people feel something about this information. And then you slide the information in. Um, and, and because, look, we feel about information. Nobody, nobody tells another person something they feel neutral about. You know, you're enthusiastic about it or you hate it or you're worried about it or you're scared about it. And you have to invest that. The worst possible thing although it's useful in TV and we've all done it, is the quick walk and talk and you are, you are substituting visual movement for emotional involvement. Uh, and they do the quick walk and talk as they explain complicated bullshit and then it's done and it's out. Um, I, think that's, but I think that's it. It's like your audience should care about everything in the script. If the information has to be in the script, it should be something they care about. And so the way the audience cares about things is your characters care about it. So find a way that your characters care about it. Yeah. You know, for me, Marcus Yalo, the, the hero of the first two books, he was um, a, a really good character for this because he was, like me, a, a, a spittle-flecked, excitable technology fan who really liked explaining technology to other people. It was part of, of who he was and how he got off. And, you know, Marcus was animated by the two things that animate me. One is a joy at how technology can set you free, and the other is a terror about how it can lock you down. And he feels a kind of sense of mission in conveying that. So it was very true to his character. And I think that um, the thing that, that made it work is the thing you just talked about, John, the salience of the didactic elements that, you know, I, I, I'm here all day for Melville explaining how to harpoon a whale, but I am never going to harpoon a whale. Whereas when I read good, you know, when I read, um, oh, in, in the big you, the least successful of all of uh, Neil Stevenson's novels, his first novel, um, which has an incredibly excellent sequence on organic chemistry and dioxin poisoning, right? I, the, he, even though it's not his most successful novel, the didactic sequences in which he explains how dioxins work and how organic chemistry works taught me more about organic chemistry than all of the four universities I dropped out of. Uh, so, <laughs> by, by the way, I want to say because I've actually been on the receiving end of that. Remember the first time my wife and I went to dinner with you and your partner? Um, I forget what you went off on, but you were very enthusiastic about it, and it was super enthusiastic, and it was just it was you were super keyed up about it. And it was it was, but it was incredibly complicated. And in the car, my wife's like, "Wow, when Corey was talking about that thing, it just was so complicated, but he really it was really important." I'm like, "Yeah," and she went, "He's so much smarter than you." I was like, "Wow." <laughs> <laughs> it's that Canadian reticence yeah, it, uh, it yeah, is, coming yeah. to the fore. Yeah, um, exactly. But, but yeah, you, when you care, when you care, your characters care, your audience will care. It's the transmission yeah. of emotion. David, David wants to know if I could adapt novels for film or TV, what would it be, if any? Um, so, you know, I, I live in both hope and fear of that happening. I, I live in <laughs> Southern California. And, and, you know, there are a lot of very unsuccessful adaptations. I think because, of, in part because of that thing that I talked about before, which is that 
the interiority of the novel is completely opposite to the interiority of the film. And so you need a good adaptation. And then as you say, John, the, the stuff that's expensive is not the stuff that's expensive in a novel. And so all of those things mean that there's often a mismatch. You mentioned Down in the Magic Kingdom. I would certainly love to be on location in Disney World for a year shooting. That would be awfully fun. I have worked for the mouse. I live with someone who works for the mouse. Uh, I don't know that it would ever happen, to be honest, but it would be exciting. And certainly the way that I ended up working for the mouse is it became a recognition symbol among Disney employees that if you were cool, you had a copy of Down and Out the Magic Kingdom on your shelf. And so they, they, that was kind of how I, I, I found my in to the company. Um, in terms of what I'd like to see adapted, I think Walk Away uh, yeah. as, as episodic TV, right? As a long, long form TV. It's that soap opera arc. You know, but if, if, if somebody dropped all your novels on my desk and I have adapted 15 or 20 novels um, to varying degrees of success, it, Walk Away would be the one I would pull the pile. I love Little Brother, but it feels like a movie. Like it feels, yeah. okay. but, and by the way, I have to say one of my favorite things about Attack Surface, because I adored Little Brother, I gave it so many, my nieces and nephews, I gave it to so many people. The entire section where the protagonist of your third novel explains how the protagonist of your first novel sucked is such like flex. It's such a character, it's such a writing flex. Um, but I will, I will say this about Walkaway, besides the fact it's very hopeful and I liked all the characters in it. I, someday when we're in your backyard, I'd like to know how you would have resolved that without the immortality discovery. Because that's the moment, and by the way, it, it's great sci-fi. I love every inch of it. I love the moment where the cops are like driven away by shame. Um, but which it just was happened like, in Belarus, which was literally just quite happened amazing. in Belarus. Yeah. It, was, it was stunning. Um, but I, but, but Walk to me is, is the one that's adaptable because it is the longest struggle. It is an actual mm -hmm. process, the process of walking away, the process of building something. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, love, I love that book. It's one of, it's, that's it's a really that's so book. kind of you, John. Gosh, that means a lot. You know, the other thing is I'm working today on a, on a new book called uh, The Lost Cause. That's a post Green New Deal utopian novel set in Burbank. It was very lucky. I started working on it in December and the lockdown just means that I have a lot of time to go and look at locations uh, on our evening walks here in Burbank. But it's, it's about people who call themselves the first generation in a century who don't fear the future. And the climate uh, emergency is in full swing. And the difference between here and there is the story they tell themselves about it. Right? The story they tell themselves about it is we have a big project. We're going to have to relocate all our coastal cities 20 kilometers inland. It's going to take 300 years. We better roll up our sleeves and get to work. And, it's, and the, the conflict re resolves around the white nationalist militias who feel like they're living in a dystopia. And, and what the truth and reconciliation process looks like with them. And for me, that's, it's, like, it's like a walk away without the fully automated luxury communism. It's walk away that really rolls up its sleeves and, and engages with what we're gonna have to do for the, for the centuries to come if we aren't to be in fear. So we have a, a question from uh, Pietra. Uh, would you end up using stunt programmers for the crashing robo cars instead of the stunt drivers? Would it change the cost of the least expensive scene? And I'll note that at Pietra also is one of the people who uh, donated a copy tonight. She, um, she uh, didn't need another copy of the book. And so there's a list online of libraries and schools and prisons and halfway houses that are looking oh, wow, for, that's great. For, for books. And if you want to come to any of the other events, there's, there's six more of these and you don't need another copy. That's one way that you can usefully dispose of it. If you go to attackservice.com, yeah, you'll find it. Yeah. So John, what do you think? I mean, you know more about the production side than I oh, do. No, it, you, How would you, you handle it, that? It, it, it's, it, what's amazing is we have all this amazing CG. It's always easy to do it practically. Like, like every time we learn how to spell fast work, end of day Yoda is better as a puppet. Like, you know, and I'm working on two shows with Henson and like every day, it's just there. And, he, and, and Brian Henson talks about actors just work differently when there's a physical object with them. No, no. I get stunt drivers and then digitally paint them out of there. It's just, just easier to have humans do them. Every attempt at automating and making robotic elements to Hollywood have done nothing but bone us horribly every time we've tried to do it. End of day, <laughs> a human being, and look, this is one of the actual, Pietra has led us into a discussion of the actual problems with automated cars. Like, end of day, how do you program into a car all of the decision-making trees that a human has? And yeah. uh, end of day, you don't. You want a human yep. behind the wheel. 
Yeah, I mean, cars, I think self-driving cars make for great science fictional metaphors and terrible ideas. <laughs> you know, they, they, they continue to disappoint. And, uh, uh, you know, I wrote a, a series of vignettes for Deakin College in uh, Australia for their computer science department called Car Wars about the ethical conundrum of self-driving cars. And the one everyone knows is the trolley problem. And the trolley problem is, you know, well, if you're programming a car, do you decide to have it kill the driver or kill someone else if it comes to it? And I always feel like that, that question starts way too late. Like, yeah. I think the more important question is, will we design cars that periodically deliberately kill their owners? And how will we stop the owners from reconfiguring them so they don't do that? Because that is clearly a better car than the car that periodically kills its owner. Yeah. Uh, so much of the discourse around autonomous vehicles, like the whole thing about technological unemployment and truckers is great because it says, look, the Bureau of Labor Statistics says trucker is the most common job we have. Truckers are very automatable. If you put a 16 wheeler in its own lane and give it a median, uh, it could, it can just, uh, you know, draft behind the one in front of it and then pull off the road when it comes to it. And, and like, there's two important things to note about this. First of all, that's just a train. That's a bad train. But that, isn't that isn't that our, our, our rule number one about tech bros is they are constantly reinventing excellent technology from sure. 1890. Like that's well, like, and a lot of the, well, or you or or your your harried and oppressed mother, right? We'll send yeah. someone over to clean up your house and stock your fridge. Like mom as a service is a is a major motif in late stage Silicon Valley. But the other important thing about this is that the BLS category, the Bureau of Labor Statistics category, that is truck driver, is not long haul truck drivers, it's everyone who operates a heavy vehicle. So that's the FedEx driver, that's the postal delivery person, that's people who do jobs that are so far off from being anywhere near what you would trust autonomous vehicles to do. Oh, yeah. And when you narrow it down to long haul drivers, it's this tiny fraction of the economy. So even if we did automate them, we decided we wanted bad trains, uh, it would have <laughs> a very negligible effect on our overall labor market. Maybe, maybe we'll take um, one last question. There's just the... Um, this last one uh, from from Adam about your your stuff about puke drafts. Uh, how many times do you rework a draft before you send it to your editor? John, did we lose you? Oh no! Oh no! Maybe we lost me. No. If you can hear me, type something in the chat. Okay, we've lost John. <laughs> All right. Well, John was nearly done, anyways. We're 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 coming to the end of the hour here. Two and a half minutes left. Uh, but I'm back. Um, <laughs> hi. I feel like so, that's a sorry, go ahead. Shall I answer that question and then we'll 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 wrap it up then? Yeah, that would so, be great. So uh, I guess the, the thing I would say is that I do two kinds of edits. I do an edit where I read through it and 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 read my notes to myself and make sure that I that I uh, got all the little things that I noted for myself while I was writing, and then I read it aloud. And reading it aloud, I find to be a very productive way to find infelicities and inconsistencies. And um, I, uh, uh, one of my um, friends, uh, the writer Bruce Sterling, who's, who's doing an event with me uh, later this week or early next week for, for this series, he uh, re revised his novel, The Caryatids, uh, when he was moving from Austin to Los Angeles to do a semester in residence at the Art Center in Pasadena. And he strapped the laptop into the passenger seat and turned on text to speech and listened to the laptop read him his book. And he would pull over and rewrite scenes as he went. Uh, and with this book, I actually worked with an outside editor. My editor liked it and I thought it was too long. And he was like, no, I think it's fine. And, and I said, no, I really think it's too long. Hey, John, you're back. And, and, and so I, I actually hired a friend of Scott Westerfeld and Justine Larvalestia, a woman named Juliet Ullman, who's a Random House editor who, who left Random House and now works for the, um, the MTA in, in New York. And she helped me cut 40,000 words out of it. The book that you, that you hold in your hands today or will shortly hold in your hands is a very different book because of her. And, and my editor was very happy I did it. So it was, it was great uh, all around. John, we're just wrapping up. But the last question was, how many times do you redraft before you send it off to an editor if you're doing a puke draft? Um, you, you know, editor is different because editor for us is agent or studio sure. or network or whoever, or, or when you're happy with it being the sales document. Um, right. I, I'd say there's a good solid, 
some sections barely get touched and some sections get reworked endlessly. And then, you know, the difference between us is it's iterative all the way up to the shoot. Right. You know, and there's been a moment I've been on set with a script I've written that I'm directing. I'm like, <laughs> well, that was well timed. <laughs> uh, you know, we didn't have time for me to talk about broadband policy. John, we lost you there. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know. Sorry. No, no, I'm I'm on crappy spectrum. Um, uh, me too. So, uh, yeah, the, the but but basically because it's an iterative process, like this, it's not the script until it's it's it, it's until it's cut. And right. so, you know, I'll rewrite a, a draft four or five times, some sections of a draft eight times, some sections of a draft not at all, but then I'll get. <laughs> so just, just to note, John's on Spectrum. Spectrum CEO was the fourth highest paid CEO in America last year. So fun yeah, fact. I know. He's it's, investing a lot in his it, customers. It's not. I, know. John, I know. I think we're going to wrap it then. But, but it's been it's iterative, yeah. Yeah, it, thank you, it, but John. But it's iterative up to the point of delivery, and that's the difference. Mm. John, John, thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. And I, it's been a real treat. It's been ages since I've seen you, far too long. And and thank you at, at the bookstore. What, oh, a, what a treat course. to see you. Yeah, I know you've got John you. Hodgman coming in to your store soon. We do this Friday. Yeah, he's a very good that's friend great. of the show. Um, a friend of the show, of yeah. The store. <laughs> No, I was just on his that. show today talking about the book and talking about the fact that we share a book birthday and that he's, he's uh, coming into to Brookline Booksmith. So those of you who are John Hodgman fans, uh, it's Medallion Status. It's a wonderful book coming to yep. the Brookline Booksmith on Friday. This Friday with Amy Mann. Yeah, we're really excited. Oh, how lovely. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you both so much. This was fantastic. Thank and and thanks of course, to the audience for coming. And thanks, Pietra, for, for being a donor as well. That's really great of you. Yeah. That's fantastic. And of course, thank you to Amber. We have her and her dad yeah. in our thoughts. Yeah. She's in our hearts. Yep. That was fantastic. Right. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Hang in there, everyone. Wear a mask. Take care. Yep. Stay safe.